This is Bonjour Chai, the Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head edition. I'm Avi Fongold in my sukkah in Montreal, and I am here with Alana Zakon in Toronto. We are your Frozen Chosen. On today's podcast, um, we will have an election wrap-up with our resident pundit, Josh Liebline. And what else will we chat about, Alana? How was your Sukkot so far? It was nice. I actually couldn't remember the last time that I lived in a home that actually had a sukkah in the backyard. Probably not since childhood, because in Vancouver, I didn't build my own sukkah. I would just go to Chabad. So that was really nice to actually be in the sukkah, in the backyard. We had some family over for lunch the other day, and um, my cousin uh who i'm staying with their daughter came over with uh, her little baby boy and he had like a plushy version of a lulav and etrog which i thought was a really cute way of kids learning about sukkot have you we, seen we, those before had, uh, two two rabbi household our kids had the plush lulav and etrog there you go along with the plush Did torah two, and the plush the what's that oh nothing i was making a very bad joke continue two no they did not have two sets of them they had one set um that every year would get passed down to the kid who thought it was appropriate and and I'm too old for that can I have a real one (laughs) um yeah anyways um yeah Sukkot is an interesting like you get like this year when it's early it's warm it's nice out and it's really pleasant to be outside Mm -hmm. um then there's years when it snows and it's pouring and it's I've had Sukkahs when it snowed and uh yeah like the Sukkahs knock themselves over I, I made mine pretty darn solid this year so uh, i wasn't worried about that but it's been the weather's been good it's been holding up we have uh we made a huge sukkah because we have lots of guests coming in for this bat mitzvah and mm-hmm. uh i'm excited to keep hosting people we have lots of stuff coming up uh we'll i'm sure we'll hear about it more next week and stuff like that um do you ever sleep yeah. in your sukkah? Are you one of those? People? I, I did when I was a when I was a kid, like in my like late teens, when I thought, oh, it's so cool, I'm gonna go and do that and sleep in the sukkah and be the whole living in it. I think really it's more. I, I don't know. I'm not worried about the critters. I'm not worried about the cold um, because we got good sleeping bags and you can put heaters in there. Um, I don't know. At some point, it just lost its appeal in the Northeast. I feel like if everybody else is doing it and you're like in Israel where a lot of people do sleep in the sukkah, it makes a lot of sense. It just doesn't seem to like fit in with our Northeastern sensibilities to just like sit there and do it every week. Um, although I have friends that do every night of the week. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's my Canadian way of celebrating Sukkot is to like recognize that maybe we don't sleep in the sukkah in the end of <laughs> September into middle October, which is when Sukkot often happens. Do you have um, any other Sukkot traditions that are, I, I always remember your story of throwing the hail on Pesach now with the marshmallows. Do you have any oh, equivalent? Interesting. What are my fine gold Sukkot tradition? traditions? So I tried to make this tradition last two years ago. And it started and then it just totally stopped. And clearly then it's not a tradition where like, I was like, you tried too make, hard to make how it How do stick. we decorate the sukkah in a cool way? So I went and I bought uh, like 10 feet of like pre-primed canvas for like painting, like for artists to like uh, paint on. Were you like Jackson Pollocking it? I'm just picturing no, you on I, your back like No, I gave it to the kids and I was like, sketch out a mural and you'll have all the paints and you can like paint a mural and we'll put up a 10 foot mural like in the sukkah. And it, now it says, welcome to our sukkah. And it's got a butterfly on it and stuff like that and like at some point I thought okay then I, we did that two years ago and I was like okay every year we're gonna b- make another mural so that after five six seven years we'll have all these murals that are really color like make the whole sukkah like alive and uh we made it one year and we haven't yet had the chance to like you know create that other ritual um I don't know who knows maybe um I keep having grand ambitions for making my sukkah more elaborate and more like modernist and architecturally Ooh, cool. modernist what's your vision describe I don't it know, like I, I, I built the frame out of PVC pipe myself was my own idea and my own way of like, you know, thinking about it, constructing it. I got all, they're always, it's modular. You can expand it this year. I made it bigger. It just meant I had to buy a few extra pipes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to like get the walls to like really be nice, like sailcloth or sunbrella, like the outdoor upholstery fabric that, that are like custom cut. So I don't have to just use tarps and like tie them down or clip them on or something like that. So I want to get a little nicer like that. I want to get you know, think about outdoor decorations as more than just like little cutesy kid things. I went to my friend's sukkah yesterday and he had giant paper lanterns that he puts up every year and it really Fancy. looked nice. It looked like a beautiful space. Um, and if we're going to live in it, it should be a nice space to like feel like you're comfortable in there and not just some rickety kid thing. That's the one custom that I have is my wife always wants me to like 
bite the bullet and just buy one of those prefab kits. Mm -hmm. I cannot do it. It just doesn't work for me. Fair enough. I grew up in a, with a wooden slat one, so that's my suka ideal in my mind. Yeah. Anyway, so that's our suka thing, and um, we're we're, we're going to get a little more mini today. We it's been busy. It's been a crazy week for both of us, and uh, we're in the middle of the holidays, so we're going to get to Josh in a minute, um, right after our sponsor. But then we'll. Uh, this is sort of a not quite mini, not quite maxi episode of Mojo Chai. We'll be back to you next week with a full slate of discussions and coverages and amazing goodness. So uh, before we get to Josh, let's hear from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Atelier Lou Bijouterie in Montreal, Quebec. Atelier Lou specializes in watches and custom designed jewelry along with a curated selection of designer jewelry. Visit them online or in person and Eric Goldberg will help make your jewelry dreams come true. Atelier Lou is offering a promo code for all Bonjour High listeners using BON18 at checkout for 10% off your order at atelierlou.com. I mean, did I tell you, by the way, before we get to Josh, um, the, the Atelier Lou gifts for the Bat Mitzvah have been rolling in already, and uh, it's kind of cool. Good gifts. You know, if you've got a Bat Mitzvah and you want to have fun, uh, you, coming up, you want to give it to him? She's been opening them. Yeah, because she gets them, and, like, she's been like, why? You're 12. You're not. You're going to want to open up your gifts and whatever. Yeah. Let's get to our election wrap-up. Josh Liebline, how's it going? It's going well. I'm enjoying the post-election, post of glow, just taking it easy, relaxing, taking a breather. Um, it was, uh, as many have said, a Seinfeld election, an election about nothing. So, I mean, I've heard that from both Jewish and non-Jewish friends. I like that. <laughs> um, what was, were there any actual stories that came down on Monday night or Tuesday or whenever? Well, uh, you're going to have to really look behind um, the uh, results to see some of the stories and a lot of people are kind of still making sense of this if you, you haven't seen a lot of post-election hot takes that's because um the what happened here can't really be broken down into a simple this person won and that person lost on the surface we're pretty much almost exactly where we were before election day um for the main for the main jewish writings not a lot shifted i mean if you are living in king aurora in vaughn king uh north of toronto you have a new conservative mp if you live in um oh, i wonder who that is uh, that would be ms anna sorry i can look that up for you ms anna roberts um <laughs> but if you okay. are in the riding of sorry we're gonna... thorn hill uh, if you're riding in the riding of thorn thorn hill we have a new mp um, a former bonjour bonjour high host uh, Melissa Lanceman, we want to send out a big muzzle to Melissa and hope that we all get an invite to your swearing it, if you're listening. Absolutely. Melissa, we will be there in person for you. But mazel tov. I was in touch with her tonight. She was really excited. But to, just to pick up on that, I'll be from the writing of Aurora um, Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill. Um, that's writing switched from conservative back to liberal after Ms. Alice led the MP cross the floor. So uh, what, what was liberal is conservative. What is conservative is liberal. If you're out west, a lot of writings went from the conservatives to the NDP and back again. Um, if you really want to look for positive Jewish stories, you can find them. For example, um, vocally anti-Israel MP, Paul, Green MP Paul Manley is no more. This, of course, leaves uh, out, in, uh, out in BC. This leaves uh, Ju the Jewish leader of the Green Party, Anne Paul, in a significantly weaker position than she was. So like I say, you give a little, you take a little. God gives, God takes yeah. away. I was going to bring that so up. So that's the kind of election it was. If um, out in the riding of uh, Peterborough Kawartha, um, Cabinet Minister Mary Monsef, who had a slip of the tongue and said the Taliban were her brother, she lost to a conservative there. So if you're a person in the Jewish community who's not a fan of that, that's something you can rejoice in. But that's kind of the stuff that, that's the kind of straws we're grasping at here, Avi. We really aren't looking at a lot of stuff on the surface. Beneath the surface, though, um, things are kind of, there's a lot of, what this election might not have really done a whole lot on the surface, but it sets up the next election, where you and I and Alana and everyone else will get to sit here and talk things about, and hopefully next time around, something more significant will happen. Yeah, I, honestly, I feel really 
bad for anime paul i don't know just watching everything go down in the last bunch of months it feels like she's been through so much and now to lose seats it just that was my first reaction because other than that nothing changed that much as you said though you can't tell the difference in thornhill the signs are still up everywhere but i guess most of the people here are observing yuntif and they're not taking down the signs yet until tomorrow yeah it really won't sink in for another couple of days we're still having the the, the votes counted there was a riding in edmonton that just flipped from conservative to liberal so oh, really? this election is not over and what it means the story has not been written it's uh, again uh, going to be another 18 months before we can really understand, okay, this one is going to be the big dance. So if you guys have specific questions, I can try my best to answer them. But uh, Well, I think some of the bigger picture stories are are like, you know, are, are, are quote unquote the stories of these, this election is not so much seat by seat, which as we see are clearly um, Jewish, the, the, the quote unquote 14 Jewish seats are the, uh, or Jewish writings tend to be fairly straightforward and don't tend to have major stories attached to them. I cannot remember. I think it was down to the 1920s and the last time Matt Royal went liberal. Um, and, uh, you know, we went from Pierre Trudeau to Sheila Feinstone to um, Erwin Kotler to Anthony Housefather, right? I, I, it's, there's a big pile of nothing in that story. It's a wonderful writing. I was the writing I grew up in, but that's that. And the same thing with many other writings that are quote unquote, the, the writings with major Jewish neighborhoods, but there's other stories. Like, you know, we had mentioned David Freiheit, who, by the way, I, um, I'm surprised he never took the advantage of having the the because he's running he was running for the People's Party and he did not have a sign his political platform did not start with Arbeit macht Freiheit, um, I think that that was a lost opportunity <laughs> right there. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we were talking about that over 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 Sukkot, um, but like the amount of Jews that were running for the People's Party, and the fact that like they were clearly Jews sending out samizdats, right, little, you know, campaigns uh, against Melissa Lansman and Thornhill, clearly um, pushing the, the People's Party to Jewish, to Jewish voters, seems like a really weird shift. It's, it's that kind of, I don't know, Trumpism that has taken over a lot of the Jewish members, a lot of parts of the segments of the Jewish community in, in America is starting to creep into Canada here. And that's a story there, if you ask me. Uh, is that a story or is it not? Well, they didn't get any seats, so that's telling. No, no, of course. Um, but Max Bernier <laughs> says that he's the only one who won the election because he got 5%, which is up from the last time. Oh, God. And, I mean, all the other Sorry. party leaders either went down or stayed where they were. So, again, this is another example of people kind of looking into the entrails of this election, including whatever they want to conclude. Um, mm -hmm. It's not anything new for political developments all over the world to happen a few years later in Canada. We can look forward to left populist movements, for example, breaking out as an answer to the so to the right populist movement breaking out here. That's something that I've been waiting for for a very long time. Um, for example, like if you, I don't know if you guys caught Mark, Martin Lukash's uh, election coverage on the breach. They had a whole bunch of people there, and they had. Um, Naomi Klein and Judy Rebick. Ah, of course. So the left wingers over at the breach had uh, were fairly represented from the Jewish community. We had Martin Lukacs and uh, Naomi Klein and Judy Rebick in fine form with a couple of other young Jewish progressives there. Um, so I would not be surprised to see uh, a, a countervailing left wing populist movement coming out of um, the ashes of the old one. So whatever is old in other countries is new again. And I've written in my, uh, what's going to be my closer for doorstep postings um, for the CJN, talking about how uh, people come from all over the world and try to make th what's happening in their countries happen here, kind of test Canada out as a little bit of a laboratory. And Canada is a little bit slow to, uh, to find these trends home, uh, at home. Um, eventually you're going to see whatever you see on the rest of the world. Canada is not immune. It just takes a couple of years. Speaking of Naomi Klein, how did uh, Avi Lewis do? I'm afraid Avi ended up in third and uh, he there and at the end the CBC couldn't even find a good election photo, a good photo of Avi Lewis. Like, can you imagine one of Canada's first NDP families? And then on the website, they can't even find a good photo of the poor guy. So, I mean, that was the, that was the writing where he had the, again, that was the, as I said to, um, my wonderful wife, Devin, who is also who is on the opposite side of the political spectrum from me. That was the right place where Avi had the best chance of running and winning. Uh, he wasn't going to, the, the NDP did not do well in any, they, they, uh, they didn't do well in any other part of the country. So if it was going to be anywhere, it was going to be BC for Avi. 
So he had the best shot of winning there. He didn't exactly, uh, like, he got endorsements from Tegan and Sarah. So he got, he had all of the ingredients for a win. I mean, once you've got Tegan and Sarah's endorsement locked up, how much better can you do? But um, I guess it didn't happen running in a safe liberal riding there. So I guess it's it's fair to say that, like, you know, I don't think that this election was a referendum on BDS vis-a-vis the Greens, vis-a-vis the NDP. Is that correct? Well, uh, what it was a referendum on is, well, with Elizabeth May elected, we might see her back as leader again soon. Um, It is, it's effectively the Greens reaching for a lifeline because they really... They, they, the, the, what's, the story of the Greens is simply is they wanted to experiment with something different and it didn't work. That's as far as they're, that's as far as they're concerned. Now, should yeah. the Greens have embraced a black Jewish leader? Probably. But you'll find, and we discussed this a couple of weeks ago, Avi, a lot of the base of the Greens might have migrated over to the PPC, along with conservatives, liberals, and what have you. So what we found out is that a lot of the parties who claim to be progressive really don't or like um, has us have might have instead just be um populated mm-hmm. by an associated collection of wing nuts so um whether whether it actually whether what the parties are trying to uh, persuade us and this is the same for all the parties trudeau trying to ask for a majority uh based on his handling of the pandemic alone and not much else aaron o'toole trying to appeal to blue collar um, conservatives, Jagmeet Singh trying to uh, dra- Jagmeet Singh trying to become some sort of avatar of the youth movement. None of that came off. But what I was, but to go back to what I was saying before, this is a little bit of planting the seeds for something that may happen in the future. And me, Paul may be able to point to her gains here in Ontario. I'm actually in the riding right now, speaking from Kitchener Center, where the Greens did win. So we may, she may be able to point to the election of Mike Morris here in Ontario and say, look, I have something to stand on my own two feet, so Anime Paul might be able to stay on. Mm-hmm. Maybe in 2021, Aaron O'Toole, if he's still around, may be able to make more inroads into blue-collar voters who would normally never think twice about voting conservative. Or maybe Justin Trudeau may have convinced people to really give him his majority back. So again, this is the planting of the seed, and the sprout will bloom through when we're back again talking about elections, right. all the three of us, hopefully. How much do you think COVID impacted people's voting this year? Because it seems like the papers were riddled with everyone's say, like every MP is like, this is what I'm going to do about the pandemic. This is what I'm going to do about this. Like, how much do you think it actually made a difference in people's votes, if at all, in your opinion? Well, Alana, think about how um, Aaron O'Toole was dogged all through the campaign about whether his candidates were vaccinated or not. Yeah. Think about how that came up and how uh, they that kind of played, and you saw and you uh, are seeing this in some other writings. Like I was reading about how uh, the post media and these people, and I'll, I'll can make the connection here in a moment. Uh, we're talking about how in some writings the Chinese community, a lot of votes went away from the, li- the conservatives to the liberals, and this was based on and and this is the explanation I was given the way the liberals were able to talk about themselves as being good stewards on COVID and vaccinations, and the conservatives not so much. So, in ways you're not expecting, in ways none of us are expecting, because all of our political superstars and geniuses and Machiavellis act like they know exactly what's going to happen, but COVID can end up changing the liberal to conservative or conservative liberal vote significantly in ways we don't expect. Mm -hmm. Uh, With respect to whether people stayed home, a lot of people did stay home in this election. The voter turnout in general was uh, quite a lot. They haven't really broken the numbers down on how much of that was due to people being just generally disgusted with the campaign versus how many people just didn't go out because it wasn't safe. I heard a lot about um, long lines lot too. In Toronto, there was a lot of yes, problems so with they, really long lines, like hours and hours of waiting. Yes, of course. And that could be because people were just kind of overwhelmed with, uh, with voting on voting day, or it could, because, it could be because uh, there were extra protocols that had to be taken into account. Like when, I know having uh, been there in the room when the votes are counted, that anytime there's a change in the voting protocol, it does tend to mess things up. Um, quite a bit. So not having personally been in the room there, I cannot say, and, but you're, and, and we're still, we're going to be analyzing exactly what happened and why there were so many lines and whether this list, whether people are going to allege that, you know, they should have had another kick at the can or a recount because of this. So again, the story of how COVID affected this election is still being written. And we have some sort of, uh, be, uh, early ideas of how that happened, but we don't have all that written yet. Right. Though I guess it seems like Canada is saying that they are in favor of how Trudeau is handling the pandemic because the liberals still won. To an extent, I would agree with that. Um, to go back to the 14 Jewish writings, the thing about their writing, those writings that they're located in cities and the liberal vote is incredibly efficient in cities. So 
with the liberals are able to swing, uh, if the liberals are able to swing massive, uh, uh, pretty much the entire GTA in the greater Montreal area, um, based on their efficient vote targeting there, does that mean that all of Canada is behind Trudeau's, um, Trudeau's handling the pandemic? Not so much. Um, the CPC picking up uh, more seats where they picked them up in the smaller cities, the NDP making gains uh, on the lower mainland of losing seats in Hamilton. All of these, uh, it's not you, what you're trying. I understand and the tendency is to kind of come away with a clear sense of what the narrative of this election is. But unfortunately, we can't do that with this election, mostly because it's a COVID election and because of all the other factors that were in play. Um, and, a, and this sort of uh, idea of this being a transitional election. So I don't really know if this is a ringing endorsement of how Trudeau handled the pandemic. It could have been more of an endorsement of how Trudeau handled anti-pandemic, anti, anti-vaxxer, anti-lockdown protesters, because that's where Trudeau really found his mojo. Like they saw people talking about, oh yeah, Trudeau got his back up against the wall and he started running not against O'Toole, not against Jagmeet Singh, but running against the anti-vax protesters who were uh, outside hospitals and really speaking huh. to them. And this really showed the liberal voice, yeah, that's the Trudeau we want to see. Someone who stands up to the anti-science, anti-vaxxers. That's what we want to see there. So in some ways, you're right. In some Mm -hmm. ways, maybe not so much. So maybe you can prognosticate for us, uh, given that that's, you know, the type of thing that you're prone to doing. Um, Prone to prognostication. That's our Joshua Liebline. Um, Where do do we go from here? What's the... uh, you know, are, are we going to be headed down the same path in 18 months again? Are we, for, for the good of the country and for the good of the Jews, wh- where are we uh, two days after this election, three days after this election? Wh- what's your f- take on this? Well, a uh, post-election, particularly one where the conservatives are supposed to win but don't, quote-unquote, what ends up happening is the party gets consumed with the question of, well, we should have won, and what are we going to do about this leader? Do we get a new one? So that's going to really take over a lot of the conservative party business for the next little while. Uh, Jagmeet Singh is not really facing a uh, challenge to his leadership, and we're going to see what happens with Annamie Paul. Trudeau is relatively secure, so everybody's going to take a few days, cool off, take a deep breath, and see what happens next. Um, as sex for the conservatives, and our friend Melissa might end up finding herself what she has to do in a leadership uh, election if there is going to be one, which is not fun, so uh, Yasha called to Melissa there. Um, but as far as what the Jews are going to do, do what we do best and wait and see. Fair enough. I mean, and essentially that's where we stood two weeks ago and a year ago. We just, you know, for some reason, unless it involves BDS or foreign affairs, specifically with regards to the Middle East, the Jewish voters don't tend to care for we scandals. They don't tend to care for Jody Wilson, Ray Bull. They don't tend to care for uh, indigenous issues. Um, I think that that's, it sounds like that's true, especially for older voters, but that's starting to change. Um, but until that changes in big numbers, you're not really going to see Jewish voters becoming real other things than single issue voters. Is that is that a fair statement to say? Well, I don't see any new issue really captivating the Jewish community. I mean, they, other than the fact that they've established that we they can, that yes, the government can hold an election on a Jewish holding, it's not going to cause a massive stampede against the liberals. Oh, that just may be the liberals. What I've seen through my years in politics is that the Jewish community does tend to vote with the larger trend. And uh, I don't see the Jewish, I, don't, I haven't seen an election where the, Jewish, where the Jewish vote has really gone against like the prevailing sense. I mean, Jews in Thornhill voted conservative, Jews everywhere else voted liberal. That was, as you said, to be expected. So I do think that if next time one of the parties gains a crushing majority, which I do think is going to happen, um, once again, me being prone to prognostication, I do think that you are going to see the majority of Jews either voting with the part with that party, or if they are, if it's the conservatives voting against it in terms of uh, moving to the NDP, as a lot of writings did on the island of Montreal, as I recall, in twenty uh, in twenty eleven. So the um, orange wave, the orange wave. So. No big divergence between the Jewish community and the mainstream, and, not, and not, certainly nothing to be expected. Like most Canadians, the, Jews, uh, the Jewish voters tended to look at the, uh, at the option and say, yeah, nothing really is getting our attention this time around, but wait and see, and see what happens. So the time has come for, to, put, to, to put on our analytical Talmudic Jewish hats and just kind of try and parse through the shut and the drush of this election and try to see what the um, answer is. But we have a lot of time to do that, a year and a half or even longer. I don't think we'll be back at yeah, this. My, my take on that is that um, 
when people perceive voters, and I'm curious both of your thoughts on this, um, people perceive themselves as Jewish voters. They tend to talk about that foreign, you know, foreign policy issues, specifically with regards to the Middle East. There are many Jews that vote on a wide variety of issues, but they don't perceive themselves as Jewish voters when they are doing so. Um, and that, that hopefully that that tide will turn because that will mean that Jews will actually vote their conscience and their thoughts rather than just saying, do I vote for Israel or do I vote not for Israel? Oh, that's such a big, that, that's my, big my th- box you're opening up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, for me, I don't know that I think of myself as a Jewish voter per se. Um, I would say that I see that more in, in the older generation as you just hinted at. But I do think that it's tricky. And I think that with everything that went down this year with the conflict, it definitely presented some challenges for me when looking at the party leaders. And I thought that was really interesting listening back to the debate that you hosted with the CJN to see the NDP standing up against the BDS thing. And um, I don't know. I think being Jewish this year has affected more of my views on politics. But generally, I wouldn't say it hasn't as much. And I would say that like 90% of my mind uh, when I'm thinking about who to vote for is more about wider issues. But this year really uh, did something to me. And I feel like uh, I just was more aware of the unsafety, especially having uh, witnessed what went down in Toronto and Montreal at, you know, riots and rallies and all that stuff. Like, I, I think it is important to to keep it in mind. What do you feel, Josh? Well, to be politically aware, that's the goal that I have. and That's hopefully something I've been able to accomplish in some small way as the CJN's resident putt or whatever you want to call me. Uh, the more Jews are aware of the general election trend, so they're not confused by what happens with Jody Wilson-Raybould or the Wee scandal or whatever the actual political issues of the day, and being able to comment and think about this on their own as opposed to waiting and being told what to think by guys like me or whoever is actually, who actually does this and, sp- and actually finds this to be fun, Whatever Jews uh, in the community, the more that they know about um, general political issues, the better off and the safer and really happier they'll be. Um, The more we know about politics, the more we understand the way our country is working, the less we will see ourselves boxed in as Jewish voters and having to vote based on how the entire community thinks it should or shouldn't vote. Mm -hmm. So I think that if I can bring any sort of context or understanding to the community through my work here, then I consider Mm -hmm. it a job well done. And thank you guys for doing that as well. I guess my thoughts are that, like, yeah, my thoughts are that I see the wider issues as Jewish issues and as such. But, like, clearly I'm in the strong minority when I go and think about climate as a Jewish issue, when I think about indigenous issues as a Jewish issue, and that I wish that more people in the Jewish community thought about it like that. But, you know, it's it's a harder, that's a, that's a much tougher think, hill to climb. But I don't think you're alone, though. I, I think it's an overstatement to say that there's no no other Jews that feel that way. Um, I think there I think are a minority and that's, yeah. I, you're probably right. But I do, I do think that there are out there and I'm sure that there are that are listening to us right now. That's right. Avi. And you are doing the work of trying to connect your work as a quote unquote Jewish professional with the actual political issues out there. And there are many Jews, young and old who do appreciate that, even if they don't say so, they're just kind of working it out for themselves. Just like this whole country did. We're still working it out. We don't really know what this is. Like, like I keep saying, a bit of a transition election where people kind of become aware and kind of try to get it right next time. So that's a positive a note hopefully to close on this time. Amen to that. And speaking of climate change, uh, because I am recording in our sukkah, because I thought that was a cool thing to do, and it has just started raining much more significantly than before, if you can hear those those raindrops coming. So it's a great place to end right now. Um, thank you, Josh Liebelein. I hope we can get you more whenever we need uh, more political punditry and uh, pontificating. And uh, we'll see you soon. And a Chag Sameach to you, and uh, good luck. Chag Sameach, and I'll be around, Avi. Don't get drenched. I got pretty wet during the CJN debate. Excellent. Oh, I heard about that. That. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, guys. Thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for Thursday, September 23rd. Our producer is Michael Freeman with technical production by Andre Goulet. Our music is by So Called. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our new page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please do leave a comment and rating on the platform of your choice. I'm Avi Feingold. And I'm Ilana Zakon. <laughs>